It is now uh, my pleasure to introduce Professor Manuel Trachtenberg from Tel Aviv University. Manuel Trachtenberg currently serves as the first head of the Israeli National Economic Council and is the chief economic advisor to the Prime Minister. He is a professor of economic at Tel Aviv University since 1984, obtained his PhD at Harvard University, and is a research associate of the NBER in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and of the CEPR in London. His main research interests are in the economics of innovation, patents, industrial organization, growth, and development. Professor Trachtenberg serves as head of the science, technology, and the economy, and of the economics of higher education programs at the Technion's Neumann Institute for Advanced Studies, and as a consultant for the World Bank. He has published books and numerous articles in leading scientific journals, and is regarded as one of the world's leading experts in the field of research and development and innovation. He has contributed widely to the formulation of economic policy in Israel, particularly in shaping R&D policy. Professor Trachtenberg, please, we are looking forward to listen to you. John and Irving Jacobs, uh, President uh, Appeloid, uh, Dean, the new Dean, uh, and uh, dear guests, I'm uh, delighted and honored to be here tonight to take part in this event. Uh, to tell you the truth, when uh, President Appeloid uh, called me up uh, to invite me for this evening, contrary to my best in instincts, I didn't hesitate and I accepted right away. I surprised myself in doing so. And there are two very good reasons for that uh, unusual reaction on my part. One is the fact that this event takes place here at the Technion. The other one is the fact that this event is associated with Qualcomm and with Dr. Jacobs. Let me explain. Regarding the Technion, I don't need to tell you uh, this institution is one of the main pillars of the scientific infrastructure in Israel of the higher education system in Israel. And moreover, the Technion has turned, particularly in the last two decades, in a powerhouse that drives much of the comparative advantage of the Israeli economy. And certainly, there is also a personal attachment that I have for this institution, uh, given the fact that they've been for quite a few years associated with the Neyman Institute. And I think that what we've done here has contributed a lot to the formulation of sound policies at the national level in Israel. The second reason is the fact that this event has something to do with Qualcomm and with Dr. Jacobs. Now, as you know, uh, Qualcomm, uh, the name, stems from the concatenation of two words, quality and communications. Well, you know, communications in all forms have become one of the defining features of the society and the economy in which we live, pervasive communication. And as to quality, the all-encompassing demand and requirement upon us in everything we do to excel in quality has also become really a hallmark of this era. And as to Dr. Jacobs, well, you know, he represents in his career, in his person, the fusion between science and applied technology that we regard so much as a model for these and further generations. So there is a great deal of meaning and symbolism in this event celebrating the establishment of a graduate school on the name of Irwin and John Jacobs at the Technion. What I would like to do this evening for the last uh, course that I know you're waiting for is uh, to share with you some thoughts about the Israeli economy and in particular our place in the world in these turbulent but very exciting times. Let me start with a bit of an historical perspective. This year, as you know, we are celebrating the 60th birthday of the State of Israel. And we know we celebrate it in many different ways, and we tell many stories and so forth. In economics, or in, in the economic field, there are a few figures that summarize, that capture well the achievements of, the, of, this, of our state in these 60 years. And they are the following. In 60 years, the national product of Israel, 
grew by a factor of 60. The population of Israel grew in these six decades by a factor of 10. And therefore, the product per capita of Israel grew by a factor of six. Easy numbers to remember. I couldn't remember if it were otherwise. Now, none of these numbers are unique. There are countries that grew faster in 60 years. There are countries that their population grew faster in 60 years. But there is no other country that experienced such a rapid population growth and at the same time such an amazing rate of economic growth. And that's something that even in this era of cynicism, we can relish upon and celebrate. It's a great achievement. And if you want another figure to remember, not 60 years ago, but 50 years ago, in 1957, the number of academic graduates in Israel, in all the institutions, was 1,000, a little bit over 1,000. Last year, it was over 50,000. And that's also unprecedented in any other country in the world. And again, that's a reason to celebrate. Now, it hasn't been a smooth ride, all these achievements. We had ups and downs. We had the golden era of growth in the 50s and 60s. But then a decade, a lost decade, starting with the Yom Kippur War of hyperinflation, mismanagement, and economic disarray. We, shouldn't, we should never forget that. And, you know, we had the influx of one million Russian uh, Jews that arrived to this country in the early 90s. Again, unprecedented for a country of this nature to absorb in two years an increase of 20% of the population. And we have done that very successfully. We turned into a market economy, for better and for worse. We were not a market economy before 85. We embraced globalization and with it, the benefits and the perils of globalization. And we turned into a high-tech powerhouse, and the Technion played a key role and still plays in that uh, respect. And lately, in the last four years, we had steady growth and the best macroeconomic performance ever when we take all the parameters combined. But that's the past. It's good mentioning it. It gives you a good feeling for a few minutes. But then you have to look into the future, and that's what I think we should do. We are in the middle of incredible challenging times in the world scene. You know, people say, well, you can always say that, no. There are several trends, several major shifts that are happening in the world economy that happen very infrequently. And we, we should be very aware of that, because the future of this country depends upon our ability, our capability to take advantage of these changes and not to fear them. So what are these great trends that we are seeing around? The first one, of course, is that the center of, gr of gravity of the world economy is shifting east. Now, you know some of the numbers. China and India combined accounted back in the eight, 1987 about 20 years ago, for just 6% of world output. 20 years later, 15%. And there is no coming back. The rate of growth of the countries that make up the OECD, that exclusive club that I hope next year will be part of, the rate of growth was, the average, was 2.7%. The rate of growth of China was almost 12%. Of India, almost 9%. Now, I want you to understand that this shift is something that happens, cannot be measured in terms of years, not in decades, but in centuries. Just to give you an example, the last time that we have seen the beginning of such a shift was in the late 19th century, when the U.S. started to emerge as a major economic factor in the world arena, and England started its secular decline. The numbers with respect to the rates of growth were not like China today, but were proportionally to the of Europe, yes. The U.S. was growing by a factor of two or more vis-a-vis -vis Europe. And the compound interest of growth rates, you know, eventually make the, all the difference in the world. 
that's one. The second one, the second major trend that we are seeing is the tremendous rise in the prices of key commodities, oil, major staples such as rice, wheat, fertilizers, some metals, and so on. Now, some people think that this is a fluke, that this is like OPEC in the, in the 70s. No, this is for real. When the world as a whole grows fast, the increased demand that all these countries are presenting to, a, to limited supplies are bound to make these prices, prices rise very rapidly. And that's kind of an equilibrium phenomena. It's not that tomorrow morning they're going to decline to previous levels. They may decline a bit, but the price of oil is going to stay around 100, if not more, dollars per barrel. And the price of wheat may decrease by 10 or 20 percent, but it's a factor of two or three compared to just two years ago, and so forth. And so it's a different world in that respect. And then there are certain basic uh, commodities, if you wish, that are not being priced in the market, but are becoming very scarce. And the main one is water. You see, if water was traded, like oil, we will see something similar happen to water. But that water is not traded, usually not traded. You know, there are certain international trade, but not much. So that's kind of the second main phenomenon. The third one is, of course, climate change, global warming, and so forth. Now, some people claim that this is new. No, it's not new. I mean, men, humankind, affected its environment throughout history. The difference is that now we are doing it at a different scale. That's one difference. And the second difference is that we have become aware at last that nature is not a given. Nature is what we call endogenous. For better and for worse, we can spoil it at the cosmic uh, level and we can improve it. So it's our responsibility, of nobody else, to take care of nature. And the last thing I want to say is that we are witnessing as a major trend the emergence, the advent of new science-based technologies particularly nanotechnology and biotechnology. Now, these technologies may become what we call, in our jargon, general purpose technologies, meaning main technologies that drive, over periods of time, the growth of the economy as a whole. Think steam engines in the early 19th century. Steam, so think electricity in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Think microelectronics and so forth. These are GPTs, general purpose technologies. Biotechnology and nanotechnology may become such driving forces. Moreover, we are seeing for the first time in decades the beginning of a paradigm shift in some key industries. Two examples come to mind. One is the pharmaceutical industry that for 50 years operated along the same lines, the same paradigmatic research line, and now it's changing. And the second one is automobiles. 100 years, the automobile industry, since it consolidated, um, not 100 years, it consolidated in the 30s, but essentially has been operating along the same lines. You know, the major inventions in an automobile manufacturer were made 80 years ago and so forth. Now we are on the, on the verge of a major shift. Now, these developments present to us a small country with a great challenges and also with great opportunities. Let me give you a couple of examples. The, the move east, the shift east, where, as you know, we are closely connected to the US and to Europe. And that has played out very well for us. But as I said, things are moving east. So that's kind of a difficulty in a sense and, you know, we see what has, what's happening with the dollar and so forth and so on. But it's also a great opportunity because new markets are emerging, not just in the East, by the way. Think of Latin America. Think of Brazil. Think of Africa that is growing for the first time in decades at some of the countries, at least in Africa. So there is a great opportunity uh, there for us. The rise in commodity prices. On the one hand, for a resource-poor country like Israel, this is an external shock that means that we are poorer. 
you know, if oil costs more, we, our real income goes down, and that's a fact. And we are affected by that. We cannot help it. But on the other hand, we can, with our technological and scientific capabilities, provide answers to the rising prices. The answer is not in subsidies. It's not in controlling the flows of commodities. The answer always comes, historically, in the way, in the form of new technologies that replace the rising prices of the old ones. So think solar energy. Think, uh, you know, the new types of cars that, that are evolving, that we can play a role in developing, that we could never play a role, a serious role, in the, the old car industry. But now with new batteries that may use nanotechnology and so forth, we may play a role. We, little Israel, uh, and so forth and so on. Think of genetically modified food. We had an edge on that like 10 years ago, but then we abandoned that to a large extent because it wasn't panning out in Europe and there were fears and so forth and so on. That's coming back big time because of the rising prices of wheat and so forth. So we can make Malthus turning his grave once again. You know, Malthus predicted that, you know, humanity was going to collapse because uh, population was growing exponentially and uh, commodities were growing uh, arithmetically. He was wrong once and twice, and this time is, he's going to be wrong again, and we in Israel can play a role in making him wrong. Now, the question is, can we manage these challenges? Can we stand up to these opportunities? Well, it's not that easy, because there are certain hurdles, there are certain internal problems that we face that need to be taken care of in a fundamental way, not in a cosmetic way. Let me mention just three of them. One is the fact that big chunks of our population are outside the mainstream of the economy. They are impoverished, they are marginalized. We are talking about the ultra-Orthodox community. We are talking about certain segments of the minorities, the Arab uh, population. Many of them lack basic skills. Some of them don't have access to labor markets. To give you a sense of the numbers, the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel, we don't have official statistics, by the way, because it's politically incorrect to do that, but you know, we estimate that there are about 8% 8, 8 of the population are growing. But in grade uh, Aleph, you know, in first grade, they approach a much higher percentage. The minorities account now for 20% of the population. Some of them, of course, are well integrated, but there are chunks of that population which is not. Now, this is a huge problem for Israel. We're a small country. We cannot afford to have 10, 15% of our population outside the mainstream. It's not just that we care for them because we have a soft heart and we cannot tolerate to see poverty around us. It's for our own benefit that we cannot allow that to happen. And they are willing, many of them, to integrate themselves. The second issue is close to home here. Our universities, our high education system is at a critical point. Uh, I won't go into the details, they are known. Uh, the issues are really manifold. Yes, it's limited resources, limited budgets, that's one issue. There is increased competition in the global academic arena. You know, we complain about brain drain and so forth and so on. We are not the only ones. You know, everybody's complaining about the same thing around the world because we live in a global world and the same way we trade oil and we invest in one country and then in another, also academic talent flows from country to country. We have institutional rigidities in our system that need to be addressed. And we cannot hide you know, behind the excuse that it's all of it a budgetary problem. No, it's not. There is also the way we design our institutions. And we had, we experienced the blessing of an outburst of students. The student you know, the number of students in Israel grew in the last 15 years to an unprecedented extent. That's great. But we have to remember, most of them, most of the delta was to colleges, and that's fine. 
but they compete for the same limited resources. So research universities proportionally got less of the pie. The third issue that is of big concern to us is we have serious problems of what we call governance, of political stability, of in short, the ability of Israel's, uh, Israel's elected government to do their job properly, meaning to govern, to lead, to lay out long-term strategies and carry them out, and so forth. There is a crisis of confidence between the Israeli public and the political system, and that's a real, really serious issue. You can decide whatever you want, but if you don't have the capability to carry out the policies, Nothing will happen. So these are big issues. We are trying, we in the government, I, you know, I still have difficulty saying we in the government, but you know, that comes with the job. We are trying to do something about it. And there is uh, quite a bit that goes on behind the scenes that may have an effect. I'm very careful in what I'm saying. We need your help in many ways. Let me give you an example. I mean, the work that Mossad Neiman does in this respect, in designing and helping, not design, but provide the scientific basis, the facts, for the wise design of policies is very important. There was an initiative by, and many of the people sitting here were involved in it, called Israel 2028, meaning what will be Israel in 20 years from now, that was presented to the government recently and really helps in frame the discussion. You can help. And each of us, it's our responsibility to contribute whatever we can to help. You know, we have this, in Israel, this uh, national pastime, which is to complain, particularly Friday evenings. You know, it's kind of a, like the, you know, the English go to the pub, we go to complain. And that's fine, you know, I do that all the time. But, uh, you know, the rest of the week, we should leave the complaints aside and do something about it. Now, we have in Israel an amazing combination of factors that I think make us one of the potentially most successful players in this brave new world that I describe. And they include technological prowess and an excellent scientific base. And I'm proud to stand here and say that because for here it's for real. We have unbounded entrepreneurship, creativity, and equally important, what we call in Hebrew, chutzpah. You need that. I mean, I believe that Dr. Jacobs, without knowing it, had a great deal of chutzpah when he decided to leave academia and set up Qualcomm. You need that. You need, and we have that, adaptability to new environments and adventurous nature the ease of mobility, Israelis move around easily all over the world. They feel at home in the jungle in the Amazons and in the New York equally well. That's a great attribute to have in this global world. So we have that. And we have one more thing. You know, we live in the knowledge economy, the knowledge era. Now we, the Jewish people, we developed for 2,000 years a comparative advantage in knowledge. So for once, there is a good match between us as a people and the world around. You know, the last time that that happened was 1,000 years ago, during the Golden Age in Spain, you know, when the Islamic world expanded and created a huge wave of globalization Knowledge became important back then. We, the Jews, the Jewish people, we had that, and we flourished, indeed, in Spain back in those times. So now again, a thousand years later, it's happening again. But there is one big difference, and that is that this time we have our own country. We are, we are masters of our destiny, and we have an historical responsibility to build upon this extraordinary historical coincidence that happens once every thousand years, whereby the defining characteristic of the world we live in, the knowledge-based economy and society, is precisely, precisely fits our own uh, traits, which is universal literacy and learning, knowledge-seeking, 
and the image of the Talmud Chacham, the Talmud Chacham as a collective ideal. The Technion is at the forefront of this comparative advantage, and I'm sure that the new school inaugurated today bearing the inspiring name of Joan and Irving Jacobs will be a key player in these exciting times. Thank you very much.